journey to be a blessing to others. Hallelujah. Come on, let's just give him praise this morning. He is worthy of all praise. Good morning, Journey Church. Good morning to our online audience. I am so glad to be here. Do you know, um, we are in the third part of our series today um, where we're talking about mantra. And uh, we've been talking about this over the last few weeks about being the branch. We started off on that first week. And the reason why we talked about being the branch is because we are not the vine. And, and, and one of the things we said that all through life, people are going through creating these mantras, the, these statements that, that have meaning for them, that re-changes cha their thoughts and train their mind, changes their thought process to focus on something deliberate, yeah. to focus on something that they aspire to be or they want to move towards. And when we talked about the first week, we said that Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. The vine produces the fruit. The vine is the one that is the source of life. It is the vine that brings life to the tree. It is the vine that does all that. It's the branches that bear the weight of the fruit. It is the branches that create the structure for that the vine can continue to grow. It is the branches that, that hold out and stand out and fill the full weight of what the vine is trying to accomplish. So we have to be the branches. That was the first week. The second week we talked about, uh, on, on mantra, we talked about, what did we talk about last week? What did I say? Anybody remember? Wreck the roof. You got it. You got it. You got it. Wreck the roof. We said that many people would use the, uh, a parable that Jesus was talking about or an experience that Jesus was going through. He was in a house in, in, a, in a town that was remote, and these people, these, this crowd was there, and they were full, and the people that needed Jesus, the people that needed and wanted to get to Jesus was blocked because of the crowd. Their back was to the very people Jesus came to reach. And what we talked about last week is that sometimes the crowd, and we can be the crowd, that will say, it's all about my experience. It's the only thing that matters is, is my experience, what I came to get. I came to get my shout on. I came to get my praise on. I came to get touched by God. But we are missing out on the people. We're blocking the people that God came to reach. Yeah, you're in the house, but are you blocking the people that God came to reach? And so how are you positioning yourself? We said you need to be like these four friends that came, and they were like, if we can't get into the door, if we can't get through the window, if we can't move the crowd aside, we're going to break up some roof. We're going to wreck the roof. And what they did is they decided to go up and they went up on the roof and they removed some tiles. They start breaking things. I'm quite sure they got cut hands and, 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 and they got dirty and, and things got messy and, and things were heavy for them to do. But they did it so that one can reach Jesus. And are we as passionate about one reaching Jesus? Are we as passionate about one experiencing our God, our Lord, our Savior? Are we as passionate as people of God, to get, making sure that we're not the crowd, we're not the Pharisees and spectating and looking and saying it's about me, but that we're getting people to Jesus. That's what we talked about the, last week. The mantra was that we want to be wreck the roof type of people. And I don't know about you, but I, I just got excited about hearing that last week. And even though I was delivering it, God was speaking to my soul saying, Peter, I want you to be a wreck the roof type of person. That means sometimes it's going, to be, it's going to appear to others that you're reckless. Sometimes it's going to appear to others that you're impatient. Sometimes it's going to appear to others that that's insane. No normal person would do that. But we're going to get one to Jesus. That's what I want each and every one of you to say, this is my mantra. I'm going to be a wreck the roof. And every time you think of wrecking the roof, you're going to say, what unconventional way that I can get people to Jesus? It's not just about getting them in the doors of a church. It's about how am I going to live my life in such a way that I can get people to Jesus? That means some people are going to, going to, going to shame you because you're in a place that you shouldn't be or they think you shouldn't be. But you're a wreck the roof type of person. 
Thank God Jesus ended up in places that were that he wasn't meant to be, that people thought he shouldn't be in. He started doing things that people thought he shouldn't do. The religious people, most of all, thought he shouldn't do because he was a wreck the roof type of person. And I'm challenging you to think differently. And we as a church collectively need to think differently. This is a different day than a year ago. And we need to think differently. We need to bring different strategies and how we're going to make sure that one experience Jesus. And I can't do it alone. It ain't going to all come from me. We need four friends. We need a, a, a people around us to make sure that we're wrecking the roof, that supports what it is that we need to do. That was last week. Now, I'm not going to re-preach that message. And, and, and the other thing, I, I'll put it here since it came up on the screen, is that you can be the para paralytic also, or the paraplegic guy also, where you underestimate what we and others so desperately need. And what did he need? He needed first for his sins to be forgiven. We think it's about changing our circumstances, changing our situation, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about, today, about that today. We think it's about those things when we first need to understand that God loves us so much and he's in, so in love with us that he's saying, I came first to meet the need that you so desperately have but ne may neglect, which is your soul. And so let me change you on the inside so that you can change on the outside and then help others. Be a ch you'll be a change agent to others as you're bringing them to Jesus because we're a wreck the roof type of group. That was last week. Now let's go into this week. And this week, I'm going to challenge you even more. I, I told Pastor Maria, the message today is an amplification of last week's message. It's just going to take last week's message where we were talking about uh, wrecking the roof and we're going to bring it to another level. So I'm just going to break it down. I'm going to get right into the word of God so that we can understand what Jesus is saying. Because I think so many times we misunderstand this important message, which will lead us to our mantra this week. Let's go into the word of God. It says, this in Luke, the ninth chapter and the 57th verse, it says, as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. He says, as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. So one of the things when I, I looked at this passage is that Jesus is walking in a crowd. And, and he's got a whole bunch of people walking with him. So I want you to get this in your mindset, the setting of what's taking place right now. And as Jesus is walking in this crowd, he says, I, this guy comes up to him and says, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. And what he's saying is that, man, I, I, I'm just excited about what you're doing, Jesus. I'm, I'm so excited that I'm committed to what you're doing, Jesus. And, and so one of the things you have to realize when he's saying this, do that again. Uh, one of the things that he's saying is that, no, I don't want you to just be excited. The man was committed to being excited about what Jesus was doing. Now, the difference is, is he's saying this man is an ideal, idealistic type of guy. He, he, he sees the heroic things that Jesus is doing. He sees that Jesus is a transformational person. He sees that Jesus is, is, is a bold person, ready to confront the religious leaders of that day. He sees Jesus as a, as a man that, that, that walks outside the system, that, that confronts the religious leaders and tells them, you are, are vipers and, and, and you are, 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 are conceited. And he, he, he could see Jesus confronting all the injustices and the things that, that he hoped to say. So he sees Jesus almost as this heroic character. And so he, and, and anyone can sign up and follow Jesus when you see the heroicness of what he's doing. Anyone would want to follow and sign up and get excited. I want to follow a leader like this. I'm excited, but you're excited for the sake of excitement, 
not necessarily the sake of Jesus. You see, you get committed for the sake of commitment, but not necessarily for the sake of Jesus. You see, there's a, there's a little nuance there, when, and Jesus picks up, he's a, he's a master teacher, and he picks up on this nuance. He picks up and sees that, that, hey, wait a minute, they're excited about what I'm doing, not necessarily excited about who I am. That's a difference. And so, there you go. And so there he says, yeah, I, I don't need you to just be excited about what I'm doing, I want you to be excited about who I am. And, and, and one of the things that, that they find, and, and, and Jesus says, and it sounds harsh, and these, all these statements I'm going to read to you today is going to sound a little bit harsh, but I think there's a little bit of idealism in each and every one of us. Where we like the idea of what Christianity or what Jesus is going to do, and what Jesus is doing in our lives. I like for him to transform me. I like for him to, uh, to, to bless my life and to do these things and to change these political systems and these social systems and, and all these religious systems. I would love Jesus to do those things. And, and I love that part of Jesus. But do I love Jesus? And look what he focuses on. And I'm going to pay attention for this in a moment. Let's go to the next verse. It says, but Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. So he says, you're looking at me, and you're looking at all the great things I can do for your life, and all the great experiences that you're going to have by being around me. You're going to see 5,000 fed. You're going to see people healed. You're going to see people delivered, and you're so excited about that. He says, but let me tell you something. This is when he crashes this man's vision of a life with Jesus. He says, wait a minute, I want you to, the reality is, as you're looking at the heroic life that I have, he says, foxes have dens to live in, and birds have nests, but the Son of Man, I, have no place even to lay my head. He says, brother, do you know I'm homeless? He said, brother, do you know I don't have a penny to my name? He said, do you know that I'm broke, busted? <laughs> I, I've been wearing these clothes for miles, and, my, and I'm walking. He goes, I don't even have water to wash my feet. Somebody has to come in and give me water to wash my feet. I don't even have my own place. He says, do you know there's a hardship to living and following me? He says, it's not as easy and as heroic as you think life is. As long as you stay idealistic, you think it's easy and there's this heroic thing that's going on. He says, but there's some cost involved. He goes, there's not going to be the glamour that you think you should have. That, that there's not going to be the luxury and the, the media and the likes on social media and the hundreds and hundreds of YouTube videos and views. There's not going to be a whole bunch of that when you're following me. He says, when you're following me, there's going to be a lack of comfort and, and, and you may not have the degrees and the credentials and, and, and all the pedigree that you think you can get with me. See, what society values, he says, when you're following me, you may not get into that. You may not have that type of lifestyle. So do you know what you're really asking for? Do you know what you're really signing up for? You see, this whole passage, Jesus keeps referring to the kingdom, and I'm going to read that in a few minutes. He keeps referring to the kingdom of God. When you read this context of this scripture, he keeps going back to the kingdom of God is like this. And what he's saying is that, that when you're following me, it's not enough to just be in proximity to me. He says, what is important is that, that you enter into my kingdom. And when you enter into my kingdom, there's something different about being in my kingdom. Let me give you an example. So, so when you drive to 
New Jersey. Jersey is so close to us right now, right? So Jersey has a border. I remember going on the Garden State Parkway, and, and there's, there's a, a point where the Garden State, you can't tell the difference. But at some point, you will cross over from New York into New Jersey. So if you're preparing at home, you're living up here, you know that's about a 20 to 30 minute drive to get down to the Garden State Parkway to cross over into New Jersey, right? And so we recognize from our point of view that perspective. Let me give you another example. I'll tell you in a moment where I'm going. We, you can go up to the utter, up northern part of New York and at some point you will cross into Canada. And that's about an eight hour, uh, eight to nine hour drive, somewhere around there, to get up to that portion to where you can cross over into Canada. So you'll do a lot of preparation, right? You, you, this is not a trip that you take lightly. You, you prepare yourself. You may make sure you have your stops mapped out so that you can get gas when you need to get gas, that you may be able to pack up. Uh, maybe some, some drinks in your car, some snacks in your car. You pack up, you get ready, you leave early enough. There's a cost to getting up to Canada. You've prepared yourself. And Jesus is saying all the preparation that you do and all the miles that you travel, all the change of scenery that you've experienced, you can get all the way up to the border of Canada and you're standing right at customs and guess what? You're still not in Canada. You see, Canada is a different kingdom. And so what I have to do is as much as I've been through, so as much as my life has been changed, as much as my circumstances have been changed, I'm still not in the kingdom of Canada, right? And so, so what I have to do is what I have to do to get into the kingdom of Canada. I have to take one step past the border. And when I take the one step past the border, now, here and here doesn't look different. But when I take the one step past the border, I enter into the kingdom of Canada, which means the laws of my previous kingdom no longer applies. He said, even though it looks to you can follow me, but you may not step into the kingdom. The rules change. When you step into my kingdom, he says, you start to follow the king's rules. You're under the king's domain. Which means you're under the king's authority. And you're under, you recognize that the things that happen here is different than where you were. But if you keep saying, well, the laws of the U.S. says that I can drive at 80 miles an hour or 75 miles an hour, <laughs> and you get stopped by a constable up there, they're going to say, wait, I'm sorry, you're no longer in the U.S. Those rules have changed. Now, have you traveled far? Yes. Have, have a lot changed? Yes. But have you really made Jesus your king in the new kingdom? Have you really decided that I can't keep looking back at what they had and keep bringing it and applying it over here? Something has changed. So here it is. Jesus is saying, when you choose to follow me, the things that you thought was going to make you successful, the things that you thought you needed to rely on, the things that you thought was absolutely important to have, he says, that is no longer important. Do you realize it's good to be homeless when you're following Jesus? Do you know what? That's right. When you're following Jesus, I don't care about my circumstance because when I've walked into his kingdom, I know that he gives me something totally different than whatever my old kingdom promised me. You see, he promised me love, joy, peace, patience, goodness. But I'm still focusing on the comforts of my previous kingdom. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Can I preach this morning? <laughs> he said... 
I'm homeless. And the man says, now Jesus tells another story. He says, he said, now Jesus is saying to another person, come, follow me. Jesus is calling. Jesus is inviting. Jesus is saying, this is what I want you to do. Now, if he's the king, and the king is calling, and the king is, is beckoning, and say, come, this is what I need you to do. And he says, now this man has been walking in the crowd with Jesus all along. You got to pick the picture right now. He says, the man agreed. He says, but he said, Lord, I want to follow you. But first, Lord, I want to do what you want me to do. But first, Lord, I, I, I know you, you, you want me to leave my job. But first, uh, Lord, I know you want me to, 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 to reach the lost in this area. But first, I need to make enough money. I need to get my career at a certain point in plateau so where I'm well off. But first, you see, what he did is he says, Lord, all of my butts are in front of you. Everything that I desire is in front. I'm going to put that first. But first, let me return home and bury my father. Now, when we look at that, we say, Jesus, that, man, you're being harsh. The man's father is dead or dying. You know, you're being harsh, Jesus. But if we, if we read the text carefully, Jesus recognized this crowd has been with him for a while. He's probably seen this man walking with him in and out, eating his food, hogging all the fish and the bread. <laughs> he's been seeing this man. And so as he's walking with this man, and it, he says, and now all of a sudden, I got something to have to do first. In other words, what he was really saying is, let me bury my father. Let me make sure that nothing is going to stop me being approved by my father. My father may not approve of you, Jesus. My father may not approve of my lifestyle when I follow you, Jesus. So let me first make sure that live with him, make him happy first. before I come and do what you asked me to do. Let me make sure the father's not dead because their law, the Jewish law, was that if his, this father was sick and ailing and was about to die, they had to sit by the bedside, Shabbat. They had to sit and wait before their father to pass. He wasn't waiting for that. He's saying, let me gain the wealth I need, my inheritance for my father. Let me live comfortably. I will follow you when I'm comfortable. But first, how many of us are saying, I know God has a call on my life. I, wanna, I have a burden to go and, and open up a, 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 a place for homeless people or a halfway house for people coming out of prison so we can minister to them. I have a goal that in my heart that a place for the people that are of the LGBT community can know that God loves them and God wants to be their friend and that God is reaching out to them. I want to be able to create an environment where they feel safe and they feel that they can be loved on by God's people. I want to create a place. Some of us have that in our heart. But first... Let me make sure that nobody's going to condemn me. But first, let me make sure I'm not going to be ashamed for doing this. But first, let me get my house in order. But first, what are the firsts that you're putting in front of Jesus? You see, we talked about kingdom. When you stepped into the kingdom, the first, if he's the Lord and the savior of your life. Remember, there's a saying that, oh, I made him the savior of my life by accepting him, but I yet haven't made him the Lord of my life, right? You've heard that before, right? He's not the Lord. I haven't become obedient to him because he's not the Lord of my life yet. But I'm a work in process, Pastor. God isn't asking for absolute obedience from you because he knows you're a sinner. He knows you're going to fail. But he is asking for your 100% commitment. He's saying, I want you to be committed to my work First, I want you to make sure that your commitment to me is above anything else. Because if you put anything else first, that is your Lord. That is your Savior. 
If I'm not Lord of all, I'm not Lord at all. He say, you have decided to make that your Lord. You have decided to make that thing, whatever it is that you're delaying, procrastinating, the call that God has put on your life, the, the burden that you look out in society and you feel and you sense, you say, I wonder if, when somebody's going to do something about that. The fact that you are aware of it means you're positioned to do something about that. And so here we go. We have to sit there and go, Lord, am I putting my career first? I told you I did for years. Did for years. God was telling me to leave uh, my job and leave my, my, my profession. And I'm like, Lord, well, I get a bonus in March. You know, um, let me get my bonus first. But first, let me get my bonus. You know what I'm saying, God? God, the money that I'm making here is more important than you. It's the Lord of my life. But first, and look at what Jesus' response is. He says, Jesus told them, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Now that sounds harsh. When you say, well, let the dead bury the dead, right? He, he, he says, your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom. I told you about the kingdom of God. He says, your duty is not to, to, to the dead. In other words, if you put these things first, the thing that you're putting first, that dead thing is ruling your life. That dead thing is a priority and it will lead to your spiritual death. He's saying it is that dead thing that you keep putting first and it has nothing to do with, by the way, let me be clear. I am not talking about the church. I'm talking about the call. Jesus called him, and he didn't call him to do stuff in the church. He's talking about the call that I placed on your life. And so many of us are asking for the purpose of our life, and Jesus just told them right here. Jesus is telling us the purpose for our life. Here it is. Your duty, your purpose, your mission is to go and preach. Now, he, preaching, we keep thinking preaching is this, what I'm doing right now. This is not the preaching that Jesus is talking about. In other words, he says, go and proclaim the word. Another version says, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Go and live. I talked about that in the last series, Fearless. Go and live in an adverse world that is against you, demonstrating and pointing your life, pointing to the God that you serve, to the kingdom authority in whom you are under. And he says, Lord, I got to bury my dead. Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. <laughs> There's a, a, a guy in history, we had to read in college, uh, his name was St. Augustine, and we had to read Augustine papers in, co in our philosophy class, freshman year of college. And um, there's a, a prayer that Augustine says, he was living with his lover, and uh, he, he was com uh, convicted by the Spirit uh, about his living condition, and his living situation with his lover. And so, he said this prayer, it's a very famous prayer. He says, oh Lord, make me good, but not yet. <laughs> Let me just say it again. He says, Lord, make me good, but not yet. And, and I think we do that sometimes. I think that's our prayer, is our prayer is, Lord, I want to go and, and do and follow you, but not yet. Lord, Lord, uh, I want to be the person that you want me to be, but not yet. <laughs> How many of us are saying, Lord, there's an area of my life that I, I want you to move, <laughs> but not, I want you to bless my finances, 
And he says, yeah, all right, so stop spending, stop living this type of lifestyle, stop doing these things. And you say, oh, not yet. <laughs> I'll get there. Not yet. Anything that I put in front of God, anything that is a but first, is killing me. Because Jesus is the truth and the life. Let me go on. I know my time is almost out. He says, another said, <laughs> another guy now comes and he says, yes, Lord, I will follow you. But first, here it is again, let me say goodbye to my family. This is the, if only I could say goodbye to my family. If only I could do these things first. If only I could look back and, and get, get everything that I, I hope to do. My, my kids aren't. They won't understand this lifestyle. So, so Lord, it's going to change. Their, I want them to get a good education in, in, in a good school. I don't need them to go into Newburgh or into this area of the city and this area. of the, Lord, they may not have the quality education I have desired for them. I don't want them to go to Poughkeepsie and, and to do something there because you're calling me to live there, but I don't want them there because my kids are still in school. You understand? What you're saying is, but first. But first, let me get this right before. I want to follow you. But first, if only I could have all these things. But Jesus told him, anyone who puts his hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom. In other words, what he's saying is, if you stepped into my kingdom and now you keep looking back. Now, we don't get this, this, this thinking too often because we, we don't see ourselves this way. But Jesus had been doing nothing in this series. We talked about a lot of metaphors. Jesus had been giving agricultural metaphors the whole time. Right. He says, I'm the vine. Right. That's a metaphor. Right. Of, of him being the source and, and, and everything. He talks about the, the harvest or the field and, and, and the field is the geographical areas that he's sending you to work in the field, the geographical locations, the places that he wants you to go is the field. He says, God is the Lord of the harvest. Right. So God is the one who takes the benefits, the fruit of all the labors of this. And he says, you are my laborers. That means you are the workers. And, and, and since you are the workers, and my father's the gardener, my father's the chief gardener, my God, he's the head, and you are the workers, that means I should be able to send you out to complete a good job somewhere. And, and so the job, he says, is if I put your hand to the plow and you're plowing a piece of field and, and you look back, you know when you're driving. And you looking at the car next to you, guess what happens when you look at the car next to you while you're driving? you start to veer over into the next lane. You veer closer to the car that you've been, drive, you've been looking at. He knows when you are looking back, what you're doing is saying, I know, Lord, that the kingdom is, the rules are different, and the things that you promised me, that I want those things, I desire those things, but I keep getting conflicted by the world that I just left, and I keep looking back at the successes of my friends and the, and the things that they're doing and, and the life that I, I admired and the things that I hoped for. I keep looking back at those things, and guess what happens here? Your path becomes multiple. You start making a path this way, a path this way, a path that way. You start to swerve, and you no longer have a straight path that has been outlined. You have multiple paths. You know what happens when you have multiple paths? You get confused. You don't even know which way to go. You don't know what, what, what to do. You keep adding all this stuff into what God has already said. If you just keep your, your I'll keep your path straight. You just follow my path, follow my lead. But you're so focused on what you may lose or what you may miss out on. Or what you may, what may be different. Let me give you an example. Frankenstein <laughs> is a monster. Why is Frankenstein a monster? He's a monster because he's a collection of all these different parts. He is a monster because somebody sewed 
apart to him that never belonged to him. And this looks different, and this looks different, and head is not fit right, and, and, it's, and, and has appendages screwed onto it. And, and everything is pieced and bolted onto him. And then the master or the leader, the, the creator of Frankenstein, has to shock him with some extra energy to bring life, some external source to bring life into Frankenstein. In other words... When we're looking back, we're bolting on the parts of other things that was never meant, the dead things of this world that was never part to be, was never meant to be attached to us. We keep attaching it to us. We keep trying to bolt it on and make it fit. And even though we're in the kingdom of God and we should have our face fixed on him, we're sitting here going, but I want this. This looks like a good piece that I want from over here. And these are dead things that are killing and eroding and de uh, decaying our life. We are smelly. We smell like dead things because we keep bolting it on. Instead of bolting on the promises of God, we're bolting on the allure of the world. And we said, I can't move forward. If only I had that. And if only I had this piece, then I'll be able to. If first I get this, and first I bring this into my life, then I'll be there. And we keep bolting these things on. Where is it that you're bolting dead things on? into your life. And God is saying, I'm not asking you to do this. I've called you to follow me. He says, and if you follow me, I want you to grab, I want you to grip the plow, and I want you to follow me. I don't want you to look back. I want you to just keep your head straight, focus on the master, focus on the king's will. I want you to make sure that you're on mission with me to do and accomplish what God is calling us to do. Are you on mission with God or you're trying to bolt on all these other pieces for your mission, not his mission? He's saying, I'm calling you to follow me, but you're saying tomorrow. You're saying tomorrow. You're saying, I, 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 Jesus said, I, I, I'm here, I'm, I'm here for you, I'm here to give you healing, give you restoration for your life, a new path. But you say, tomorrow. He said, I'm here to, 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 to restore everything that the enemy has, has taken from you. But you keep delaying by saying, but first, Lord Jesus, tomorrow, could you wait a day? God is saying, no. I want you to grip the plow. I don't want you to be excited, idealistic. That's the first guy was idealistic and so excited that he was just excited about the excitement of what was going on and not Jesus. And these last two guys were realist. They realized that they were going to lose some things. They realized that there was going to be some sacrifices. They realized that the things that they had grown accustomed to was not necessarily the things that they were going to have to carry into this new kingdom. And they were realists. And so they were saying, but first, let me hang on to those things. And Jesus is saying, I want you today. I want you today to follow me. I want you today to commit to me. I want you today to commit to my will. And we as a church have to be a, a church that is together on mission to accomplish one, getting to Jesus. Accomplish one, doing what he's called us to do. We have to grip the plow and not turn back. Not look back and not hope for what's here. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, but I know there's, there's something that God wants to do in this Hudson Valley. And, and we can't stop and, and say, tomorrow, God. But first, I want to do these things. We got to say, today I'm ready. 
to follow you. Why don't you stand with me today? Jesus says, be restless. Yes. Won't you please let me be? And you say, I will. But tomorrow, Jesus says, I am He who supplies. Yes. 